I'm sure we've all heard it a thousand times. All you need is faith in Jesus, and your soul will be saved. On the surface, it seems simple enough. I just need faith in one fact, and my soul goes to heaven. But how much are we really being asked to believe? In this one sentence alone, I've got two vague ideas that somehow go together to save a mystical ghost. Have belief in some guy named Jesus somehow makes my ghost saved. Wait a second, I feel like I'm being hoodwinked. So how much are you being expected to believe? Just to accept this simple claim? Well, first you have to wrap your head around the idea that there's a ghost that lives inside your body called a soul. The soul is infected with a substance called sin that entered the world when a talking snake told a rib woman to eat a fruit, and now every human ever born is infected with sin. There is a super ghost called Yahweh, who is actually a part of a three ghost being called God, and he hasn't been seen for thousands of years. Yahweh hates sin so much that he'll send souls containing sin to hell to be tortured forever. So, um, I suppose there's a few points right there. Let's see, uh, there we go. But there's a catch. You see, there's a man called Jesus. This is the original person we were told to believe in when this whole thing started. The hypothetical evangelist in this example just skipped over the reason why you needed Jesus, as if it weren't important. We're now in John 3.16 territory, and it's the only part of the Bible that many Christians know. What the evangelist fails to tell you is anything useful. And same goes with plucking John 3.16 out of its context. You see, you can't just believe there was a man named Jesus that existed. That gets you nowhere. No, you have to believe that Jesus is a part of the super ghost called God. And God got a virgin pregnant without her consent so that she would give birth to himself. You have to believe that Jesus is God. But that still doesn't save your soul. Which is one, two, three, eight points back. What the evangelist didn't tell you is that you have to believe this next part. You see, God loves the world so much that he's going to kill Jesus, who is also God. So um, it starts to get fuzzy here. You see, God wants to send a sacrifice to pay for the penalty of sin, but he's not going to sacrifice anything. Let me explain, because you have to believe this too if you're going to heaven. God is going to sacrifice himself to himself to appease himself. Now, according to Christianity... If you have faith that Jesus died for your sins during this sacrifice, then your soul goes to heaven. So, um, are you still with me? Jesus also comes back from the dead after three days. What was sacrificed? The problem is that the penalty for sin is eternal death and damnation into hell. Jesus only spent three days missing, according to the biblical account. Christians get the idea that Jesus went to hell for only three days. I'm not sure where they get that idea or what purpose Jesus accomplished down there. The fact remains that the penalty for sin only seems to have gotten a down payment. If Jesus was truly sacrificed, he'd still be dead. He'd still be in hell. So you're going to have to have faith that this death counts as full payment, even though he came back. You're also going to need to have faith that killing an innocent person makes everything bad you've ever done in your entire life all better. And here is a second catch. Jesus is not going to pay the penalty of sin for all the people who don't believe. I guess dying on a cross to save a few people is way better than dying on a cross to save everyone. You have to be a part of the Jesus fan club in order for this sacrifice to count for your soul. Jesus must be a terrible economist because in a world population of 6 billion, even at very optimistic estimates, there are only 2 billion Christians. Jesus could have had another 4 billion, and that only counts for people who are alive at this very moment. Think of how many people have lived and died from this day back until Jesus died. How many people went to hell because Jesus only wanted his fan club to make it into heaven? Think of the billions of people that died before Jesus was ever born and had no idea they needed to have faith in a death upon a cross in order to go to paradise. Think of the trillions upon trillions of dogs, cats, fish, birds, insects, fungi, plants, reptiles, amphibians, bugs, mollusks, worms, single-celled organisms, and all other life on earth that will go to hell because it is incapable of understanding such concepts as sin and soul and God and redemptive sacrifice through scapegoating. What about the billions of people who never heard the name Jesus or never even seen a Bible or heard one read to them? So let's see, we've got 1, 2, 3, 15 articles of faith that you need to accept all at once. If you don't believe in all of them, then the whole system just falls apart. Without a soul, you don't need Jesus. If you don't believe Jesus' mother was raped by God, then Jesus isn't the Son of God. If you don't believe in hell, there is no need for Jesus, etc. Which of these points can be proven? None of them. Which of these points can be verified? None of them. Which of these can be seen, tasted, touched, heard, or smelt? None of them. 
You see, all of these points are based upon faith and nothing else. Well, faith in what exactly? Faith that this isn't all bullshit. No ghost ever came to me to explain this. None of my friends were ever given this information by a ghost either. You see, all of this knowledge comes from a very old book, and we just decided to believe it because it's in print. Oh dear, it looks like now we need to see how much faith we need in order to believe in the Bible. Well, the first one still stands. We need to have faith that this religion isn't just bullshit. The same kind of bullshit you Christians think that makes up Scientology, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Pantheism, and all the other religions in the world. Your religion is special, just like all the other religions out there. Next, we need to backtrack this Bible to God. So first, you need to have faith that the translators did a good job. This one doesn't require all that much faith when we're talking about Latin into English. But what about when you get more in your copy than you did in the original? I'm thinking about that poor, poor woman dragged out of her adultery and brought before Jesus for judgment. You'd think the earliest works would include that story, but it seems that only copies bothered to include that bit of wisdom. Maybe the translators were improving upon the canon. You see, there were several dozen gospels, stacks of letters, and plenty of historical records that could have been included in the Bible. The Bible even references several of these works. There's the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Jesus, the list goes on and on. And it seems that those works were not Bible-worthy. Seems odd that Jesus didn't make the cut. But you just need to have faith that the early church included the correct works into the biblical canon and excluded all of the bullshit. Because, after all, if those other Gospels were erroneous and full of lies, what proof do we have that the four Gospels are correct? Well, who made the works that are in the canon? I suppose we now need faith in the authors. The bulk of the New Testament is written by a man who killed Christians for a living, changed the requirements of getting to paradise, and claims to see dead people. Yes, St. Paul, we need to have faith in him now. We need to believe that he didn't make up a religion like Muhammad did, or Joseph Smith did, or L. Ron Hubbard did, or any of the other founders of religions. If we go back to the Old Testament, we also need to believe that generations of people could keep the exact details of the earliest stories alive for thousands of years with an oral tradition. Now, I know that this is the best system that they had going for them, but is this an accurate system? Genesis, a story that spans many generations and thousands of years, isn't written until very much later. We just need to have faith that those stories weren't ever exaggerated or altered or made fantastic in any way. We just need to believe that people lived for hundreds that's hundreds plural, of years, and that angel men raped women who gave birth to giants, that a tower was so big that God scattered humanity across the globe and changed their language, that a 500-year-old man built a wooden boat the size of an aircraft carrier to hold two of every kind of animal. Yeah, all of those stories were preserved for generations just exactly as they happened. Of course, no mere human account would be good enough. The Christians want us to believe that the Bible is actually the Word of God. Even though it was written by men, Christians want us to believe that God actually wrote it, maybe by means of dictating. But wait, are we really going the divine dictatorship route? That opens up a whole bunch of doors. We need to have faith that God isn't really just testing us with this book to see if we are moral and good enough to see through the falsehood to achieve redemption with a good spirit instead of faith. We need to have faith that the Bible wasn't actually orchestrated by the devil in order to steer us away from the true faith. We need to have faith that the Bible isn't the product of some cult that isn't the Christian cult in order to trick all the inferior cults. And we have to do this because we can't trust this book just because it's very old. There are many books that contradict this book and they are even older. We can't trust this book just because it's written upon a page. Otherwise we have to believe in dragons, Jedi, munchkins, and a whole host of other creatures that have been written about. No, you can only accept the Bible by faith.